Hey there, everyone, and welcome to topic number five in our database design and management class. In this topic, we're going to learn about many more things related to database design. In this video, part one of topic five in our database class, I'm going to discuss how we can transition from a data model to an actual real world database. So we started off long, long ago, all the way back in topic number two by learning to create some parenthetical relations. This was our first attempt at uh, designing these data structures. So uh, hopefully this still looks familiar, right? The idea of describing a relation just using text where we put the name of the relation and then inside parentheses, we list all of its attributes and uh, we can underline one or more attributes to indicate that it is a primary key. And if we have a foreign key, then that attribute, its name would be italicized here in our parenthetical relations. So uh, this was our very first eyes in doing database design. And since then, we have more recently transitioned to entities and these entity relationship diagrams, right? So we're now creating things that look like this. And uh, it is, of course, the same information. It's just presented in a graphical way instead of a textual way. So what we see up here can be readily translated into uh, what we see here in this entity relationship diagram. And it's essentially the same information. It's just displayed in a different way. Here we're displaying it more graphically, right? Where we use these rectangles to represent uh, the entity instead of a line of text and the name of it here. And then we list primary key attributes and then additional attributes. In this case, they're all non-key attributes here. And instead of marking our primary key by underlining it in this parenthetical relation, we show it as an underlined value here with the letters P, K next to it to indicate the primary key. And we would do the same thing with foreign keys, just using the letters F, K. And as we now know, we can use bold-faced or normal face type in order to indicate the null status of these various attributes. We also learned how we can use rounded corners as a means of visually indicating that a uh, particular entity is weak, or we can use sharp corners like what we see here on this example to indicate that an entity is uh, strong. Okay. So we learned all these sorts of things last time. And ultimately though, this is a design, right? But there isn't enough information here for someone to easily implement this in a real world physical database, right? If we gave this design to a hundred different database administrators with just the information that we see here. And we said, implement this table or implement this as a table in a physical database. We would get a lot of variations because uh, although a lot of information is provided, there's still some missing information here. For example, we don't know what the preferred data types would be. And right? so we need to provide that additional information as a way of transitioning from entities as we see them here that would appear in an entity relationship diagram to tables, right? So uh, here over on the right, then we can see that we're providing a bit more information so that, so there isn't as much confusion or ambiguity or uncertainty in the intent of the uh, designer of this database. So in this case, we have all of the information that we had before over here in our entity representation, but uh, over here on the right in our table representation, we have at least some additional information like these data types as well. Okay. So naturally, if I want to be able to implement a table in a real world database, I need to provide this type sort of information. Otherwise we find ourselves making assumptions and assumptions in the world of database design are generally not a good thing. <laughs> All right. So more formally, the process of transitioning from an entity relationship data model to a physical database involves quite a few steps, as we can see listed here on this slide. 
So briefly reviewing these, the first thing that we're going to do, if we receive like an entity relationship diagram and our objective is to implement that as a real world database, say for example, in Oracle or MySQL or SQL Server, the first thing that we will do is we will create a table in our database for each entity that appears on the diagram. Right, so uh, we have a bunch of entities appearing on the diagram. Say we have three of them. We create three new tables. And of course we have to provide each table with a name. That name should be descriptive of what it contains. That is what the rows within the table are intended to represent. And uh, as we know, we're also going to have to create or implement a set of attributes for each table that uh, together represent fully describe the entity from the perspective of the database. That is whatever our set of attributes may be, that is the entire entity <laughs> as far as the database is concerned. Right? So if I have information about customers and I provide the, I don't know, a customer ID and the customer's name and email address and phone number, and that's all I have, well, as far as the database is concerned, that is a customer. A note on names, the, of course, there are no hard and fast rules on naming tables, but uh, best practice is generally to give tables descriptive names that are singular. So as an example, I would name a table employee. Yeah, let me choose a little better color here inside. I would choose a table name of employee rather than employees. Okay. And uh, the reason is that what the, what each row in the table represents is one employee. Okay. So uh, when we're talking about relationships and things, we would say each employee is related to a department in some way, right? But it's singular, right? So each employee as a department. So the general best practice is to not use plurals when naming your tables, but rather to use a singular form. If you happen to come from a culture where your native language does not use plurals, then this should already be relatively easy for you. <laughs> you just stick with what you know. But if you come from a culture whose native language has an explicit concept of plurals, like English, where you can attach an S to the end of things to indicate that there's more than one involved, then yeah, you want to pay attention to this best practice on naming conventions for tables in your database. All right, moving on. Of course, we uh, can't just create tables because tables don't really have much value or use unless we also provide attributes for them. And in the context of physical database designs, we will refer to those as columns. So although in entity relationship diagramming, we call them attributes, we can call them columns once we actually create these tables in a physical real world database. And in addition to the name of the table, we need to provide a set of properties. Some of these are required, others are optional, but nevertheless, we need to have enough information provided to us or enough knowledge on our own in order to specify values for each of these column properties. One, which we mentioned on the previous slide, a very, very important one is a data type. And as we know, data types are important and choosing a correct data type is important because that choice defines what type of information can be stored in that column, as well as the range of acceptable values that can be stored in there. And in the case of some numeric data, the precision, like the numerical precision that we can hold. So for example, if I am implementing some kind of say finance or banking application, I need to make decisions about uh, what kind of decimal precision do I really need? If I'm say calculating accrued interest, where I say I'm going to, maybe I'm a bank and I offer people a 2% interest rate on their savings. Well, since I'm and whatever their savings are by a percentage, I'm going to almost certainly have decimal components and I need to figure out what sort of precision do I need? 
Like how many decimals do I need to be able to support in order for things to make sense? Right? Because we can't support an infinite amount, even though we know that when we're doing that sort of decimal division, oftentimes we get these numbers where there's an infinite number of decimals. Okay. So a simple example would be like the concept of one third, right? If I try to type that out in decimal form, I get like 0 0.33333333333 and on and on and on it goes forever, right? So how many of these decimals do I need to be able to support? Eight, 15, a hundred? <laughs> the answer to that question will determine a choice for data type for this type of problem. So data type is a critically important choice to make. Null status, we've talked about this throughout our class, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. Suffice it to say, this is a required property that we need to specify, or we can just let it sit at the default value. But the point is that every column has one. So regardless of whether we set this ourselves or not, the column will have a null status. Okay. And the same applies to the unique status. So every column has one of these, regardless of whether we set it or not. Just as a reminder, if a column is marked as it's similar to say a primary key in the sense that that says that every row within that table needs to have a unique value for whatever our column is. So for example, if I, I don't know, a table that held customer information and uh, one of the columns in there was the customer's first name. And if I decided to make that unique, then we could only have one customer per first name. That is, if we have an existing customer, say a customer named Dan, and then we have another customer that has the same first name, if that column is marked as unique, then we would not be able to add our second person there because the first name column would be marked as unique. So again, even if we choose not to set this explicitly, every column will have one, okay? In SQL Server, just as an example, by default, the column status is not, I can store duplicate values in the column by default. Okay. And uh, then we have some other optional things that we can provide, default values. So for example, maybe we have some sort of timestamp, like a date and time, where an event occurs. And if we do not explicitly provide that, we could have the database just automatically fill in the current date and time according to the system clock of the server on which the database is running. So we can specify default values for those kinds of things. And you could imagine the same sort of thing in, I don't know, some sort of a business environment. So say that I own a, I don't know, a fast food restaurant. And uh, when I hire people, I need to record what their hourly wage will be. So how many dollars am I going to pay them per hour? So if it's like most fast food places, that value is probably very close to the minimum wage. So I might just put in some kind of minimum wage as the default value. That way, when I hire someone, it automatically assigns them that wage, that hourly rate. And of course we can provide constraints. Right. So we learned about like range constraints where we can say that, Hey, certain columns only have values that are the only acceptable values for the, for that column is within a particular specific range. Now, the example I frequently use is like somebody's year of birth. Maybe you're recording information about your customers and you want to know what year they were born in while well, we can limit that to a reasonable range using data constraints. Another option would be if be somebody's month of birth, right? It wouldn't make sense for us to say that this person was born in month 27 or month negative 182, right? So we could impose some reasonable constraints there so that if you use the Gregorian calendar, at least that you're going to have 12 months in your year. And so you can impose a range constraint there. And we have other ones as well that we learned about, like referential integrity constraints, et cetera, for relationships. And speaking of relationships, we can note with these constraints, things like cascading updates, deletes, et cetera. And of course, it's good practice for every table to have a primary key that will guarantee the uniqueness of every row. 
So we want to make sure we specify or mark one of our columns as the primary key column, make sure that we implement foreign keys as necessary to ensure that our new table is related in whatever way we desire to other tables in the database. And once all of these things are done, then we'll have a basic framework for a table. There still aren't any data in the table. It's just, it's a framework, right? It's structure are complete at this point, but we then have to analyze it and say, does this make sense? Does this design achieve the level of normalization that we require based on our use case? And if the answer to that question is no, then we may need to revise our design a little bit in order to reach whatever sort of level of normalization we want. We, as in the business world, are typically going to target third normal form or above, and that's what fully normalized means to us. But as we'll learn as we continue our adventures in this topic, there are certainly times when maybe we don't want a fully normalized solution. So. Based on our specific needs, we may need to do a little denormalization and back off on that fully normalized design a little bit. So we'll learn about that here in our exploration of this topic. And remember, all of these things are for every single table, right? So as, as we go, we implement these tables based on our entity relationship diagrams. We have to go through these steps for all of them. And it's not a big deal if you're only working with four or five or six tables. But if you have four or five or 600 tables, that you can imagine this is quite a time consuming and lengthy and tedious process.